than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and All right, today's lecture is going to be about index concurrency control. Uh, before we get into the details of that, let's start off with administrative stuff. So project number one uh, was due last night at 11.59 p.m. Um, we can't finalize the leaderboard just yet because people still have um, uh, late days, uh, so they can turn it in technically up to four late days. So uh, we'll be able to finalize the, the leaderboard um, by the end of the week. Homework number two is due uh, Sunday, October 3rd, also at 11.59 p.m. And project number two, uh, which will be about hash indexes, uh, is going to be released today, and it will be due on uh, Sunday, October 17th. So uh, before we get into the concurrency control stuff, I wanted to start off uh, by answering a few questions uh, that were brought up last class. So the first is about um, non-prefix lookups uh, in multi-attribute B plus trees, and the second one is about efficiently merging B plus trees. So uh, in, in the last class, I showed this slide um, that talked about uh, selection conditions on a multi-attribute index. So in this case, the index uh, is built on three attributes, A, B, and C. Uh, and the, the two types of operations that I said were supported were uh, A equals five and B equals three, as well as the second one, that's uh, B is equal to three. So um, the, the question was specifically about the, the second case, how could we support this B is equal to three? So this was the original tree that uh, I, I showed in the lecture. Um, and I showed these two operations, and I, uh, uh, I, I didn't show the, the uh, uh, search on star or wildcard B uh, because this tree was too simple. So we'll, we'll throw out this tree and we'll hopefully give a better example that illustrates that uh, second point that I wanted to make there. So uh, instead of naming the columns A, B, and C, um, instead we're gonna call them call one, call two, and call three. And the uh, types of values that they can have are uh, A, B, C, and D. So this is the entire alphabet that we're going to allow, just these, these uh, four characters. So each column can either have an A, a B, a C, or a D. Uh, and now the operation that we're specifically focusing on in this case was, um, is column two equal to the value B? So what would this look like? Well, as I said, we need a more complicated tree. Uh, sorry if that's a little small, but uh, the, the slides are also available online. You can take a look at them there. But uh, uh, the, the tree is substantially more complicated. It's also fully packed, so we didn't leave any extra space in there just so we can fit it all on the slide for the example. But the way that this is going to work, um, as I sort of alluded to uh, last class, involves uh, uh, starting at the root node. So we're going to start here. And we're going to try and, as we descend the tree, exclude subranges that uh, the, the, the uh, key, key call to equals B can't possibly be in. So we're going to start here in the first key range and kind of just descend the tree and kind of try to rule out any uh, possible subtrees or subranges that, that that key can't, we know can't possibly appear in. So uh, again, we kind of start there and we work down the tree. Uh, we're going to get to this node, which we'll see uh, it covers the range of AAA, so the values in all of the columns, that's the max possible value we can have. Um, so the, the keys are you know, greater than or equal to that, and they're strictly less than ABA. So in this case, we know that we don't need to look at this node here because there can't possibly be a uh, key that has B in the second position. So going back up to this uh, um, inner node here, we're gonna look at the second uh, range that's covered, which is from ABA uh, inclusive up to ABD exclusive. So of course, since B appears in the second uh, position here, we do need to check that leaf node. So we're going to grab that, that uh, node there. Again, if we look at, at this range here, it's going to be from ABD to ACC. 
And of course, there, there uh, could be a, a value B in the second position there. So we need to grab uh, that leaf as well. Now we get to the last one, um, which we know is between ACC and ADB. So there can't possibly be a B in there in the second position. So we don't need to check that leaf node. So kind of you can continue with, with the same intuition across the uh, uh, full span of the tree. And we can sort of rule out these subranges or leaf nodes um, where we know that the value B can't possibly exist in the second column position. So this uh, is sometimes, I think, in Oracle, uh, maybe some other DBMSs use the term skip scan because the idea is that you can sort of skip along um, only looking at the pages that you're interested in because you know um, something about the subrange that, that they cover. So I hope this makes a little more sense than uh, the explanation I was trying to give verbally last class, this picture. Uh, and again, the slides are on, online so you can um, take a look. I, I know the, the letters are a little small, but um, we needed a sufficiently complicated tree to kind of illustrate um, this, this technique. So are there any questions about this before we move on to the other um, question? Yes. Uh, so the question is you can ex extend this to any subsequence. So do you mean any uh, column value that's supported or any subrange? I uh, sorry I didn't, I didn't. Right, so the, the, the question is, can you, you can only do the skipping on the, the um, uh, not, not the, the last column that you're ordered by. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's correct. So because you don't know what's going to be in the last position there, you can only do these sort of filtering uh, on, on um, columns that are more important for the sort order that's uh, guaranteed. But you can, as you're descending the tree, I mean, imagine, you know, this, this has three, uh, this is an index built on three columns. You could generalize to an arbitrary number of columns. Um, and you may be able to, so all of these uh, filterings take place at the leaf nodes. You may be able to uh, actually f f perform like uh, earlier stopping during your traversal. You don't have to traverse all the way down the tree. Does that make sense? Okay. Are there any other questions about this? Great. Okay, the second question uh, was about efficiently merging B plus trees. Um, and I said uh, in, in the, the last class that I wasn't aware personally of any algorithms, um, but I'm sure that there has been some work done on it. I think that the most basic case, um, which uh, I'll talk about here is kind of, since the, uh, the trees give you this um, sorted order, you can perform kind of like the uh, merge phase of a, of a, of a um, uh, uh, since they're in sorted order, you can just do, I was going to say the merge phase of a, a sort merge join, but we haven't talked about that yet. So, um, but the, the, since, since both of the inputs are in sorted order, you can just kind of pull um, one, uh, the, the uh, smallest value from the head of each uh, input um, to merge them together. So um, that's kind of what this, uh, this uh, uh, approach number one here is. And the, the paper I, I referenced, I think it's from uh, 2005, uh, it was published in a, a database conference. And uh, it kind of enumerates all the different techniques that you could have for uh, merging B plus trees. Um, so they, they talk about these uh, first three and then they present the fourth uh, lazy approach in the paper. Um, which I'll, I'll explain in a second. But so the, the, the first approach is kind of uh, to do things in an offline fashion where you're, you're blocking. So you block all operations on, on both of the trees. You don't allow any um, uh, modifications or reads to the trees. Uh, basically, you do that by putting an, an exclusive 
latch on the trees, which we'll talk about in today's lecture, but you're going to lock the trees, prevent any uh, concurrent access from happening, and then you're going to perform the merging, uh, pretty much what I described, merging the leaf nodes and then building up the tree um, in an offline fashion. Then when you're done, you have a, a fully merged uh, B plus tree, and you can you know, let, let uh, other threads start using it again. The second approach um, is this, uh, it's called, they call it the eager approach. Uh, it's basically like an incremental approach where um, if you have, assume you have you know, two uh, B plus trees you want to merge, the threads that are querying them need to access both trees. So you access the first B plus tree, uh, look for whatever values you need there, access the second B plus tree, and what you're going to do is you're going to move uh, batches eagerly between them. So you're kind of going to leverage the um, accesses of other threads in order to merge the trees. So every time that a thread gets to a range that, um, you know, it, every time that a thread accesses the tree, it, it merges in the values from one of the trees to the other uh, to make sure that, that we can get them uh, synchronized together. The uh, approach number three is the background approach. Um, basically, uh, it, it's, it's sort of similar to the, f the first offline approach, uh, except you're not blocking the trees. Basically, you're, you're creating a copy or like a snapshot of each of the trees, applying, uh, doing the, the merge offline somehow in the background. So you build up this uh, merged tree. And then um, you go back and uh, there may have been modifications to each of the individual trees since you did your snapshot or your copy. So you'll need to go back and apply any uh, updates that you may have missed. Then you get this final merge tree at the end and there's some kind of uh, you know, quick switch out where you can switch out the other two with the, the new one that you've constructed. So you just need to have some uh, short term latch to prevent um, uh, modifications while you're, you're replacing the old two uh, B plus trees with the new merged one. And the final approach uh, is approach number four, which is presented in this paper. And uh, their idea is basically that they're going to designate one of the trees, one of the B plus tree indexes, um, as the main index and one as what they call the secondary index. And usually they, they choose it so that the main index is the larger one and the secondary index is a smaller one. Um, for efficiency reasons, but uh, either, either way would work. Um, and what, what the algorithm is going to do is essentially if the leaf, uh, if you're only going to access uh, one of the trees, so unlike in the eager approach where you have to access both, um, you're only going to access one, one index, the main one, uh, and when you get to a leaf, you're going to ask, has this leaf uh, been merged with the leaf from the secondary tree. Have we merged in those values from the secondary uh, B plus tree to this leaf node? If uh, it has, then you're done. You don't have to do anything. If uh, it hasn't yet been merged, then you'll have to go uh, over to the secondary B plus tree, grab that, the, the corresponding range that's covered by the leaf, and then merge it into the primary. So it's done in this kind of lazy way um, you only do it when you access something and you only have to access the, the main index, you don't have to access both. So uh, this is, as, as far as I know, a pretty good summary. Um, uh, the the paper is called Online B-Tree Merging. Um, if you're interested, uh, you should take a look. Uh, there, there may be, as I said, more um, advanced techniques that you can apply here, but I, I think this is a pretty good summary, high level summary of the different, uh, some of the different trade-offs you have. So are there any questions about um, this? Okay, cool. Now we can talk about um, concurrent data structures. So in the last two classes, um, we've talked about the d different data structures uh, that we use as indexes in the DBMS, primarily hash tables and B plus trees or you know, trees in the, the B tree family, primarily B plus trees. Uh, and for simplicity in all of our conversations, for the most part, we've been assuming that um, all of the, the data structures are accessed only by a single thread. So there's no concurrent access, there's no concurrent reads, writes, there aren't any changes or modifications going on to the tree. 
um, at the same time. So everything happens in you know, one single thread, and for that reason, we didn't need to worry about um, either the, the, the layout of the data, data structure changing, uh, or trying to do traversals or reads or something, um, or uh, the, any, any types of anomalies coming up from concurrent access. So now, uh, if we're going to allow multiple threads to um, run in our DBMS, which is important in order to leverage uh, parallelism in the CPU. Uh, so if you have multi-core CPU, you can have a lot of concurrent threads running. Um, and to hide uh, the latency incurred by disk stalls, I.O. stalls. So if I have a thread that's blocked waiting for reading uh, from something from disk, I you know, don't want to have to wait around for that to complete. I can schedule another thread in there uh, while that I.O. operation is proceeding. So um, if, if we're going to allow multiple threads and we want to uh, uh, operate concurrency in our, uh, concurrently in our DBMS, we need uh, some way of designing the DBMS, including the data structures and everything uh, in the internals in order to protect itself from uh, concurrency errors. So th there are a few um, notable examples of systems, and we, we won't really talk about them in this class. Um, they're primarily main memory systems, but uh, there was some research uh, probably about 10 or 15 years ago that looked at the time spent in uh, DBMS internals, so you know what, what the DBMS software itself was executing, and there was a lot of overhead spent in uh, latching and, and concurrency control and that, that uh, sort of code path in the DBMS. So kind of the, the key insight behind some of these approaches was if you're in memory, then uh, you don't need to really worry about um, disk IO stalls. So the idea is that we can get rid of concurrency control and the way that we'll avoid uh, any kind of concurrency errors is by partitioning the DBMS into uh, uh, disjoint subranges. So for example, imagine you have keys, you could split it up into you know, the keys from uh, A to D and then E to J or something. You can kind of partition up the um, uh, range in this way and let uh, each uh, partition operate with only a single thread. So this is kind of the idea behind um, shared nothing systems where you, you kind of partition up the data in a way such that uh, you don't need concurrent threads running on, on um, the same data partition. So uh, again, these are kind of more advanced systems. We're not gonna talk about um, them really in this course, but uh, if you're wondering about any of these, uh, you should check out the, the uh, papers. They're pretty interesting. So uh, just to, at a high level to, to kind of ex, ex, explain what we mean by concurrency control, um, the, the high level idea is that uh, the, the DBMS is going to ensure correctness and uh, the, the term correct is in quotes because we'll, uh, that's the, you know, the key word there and we'll explain what that means uh, in a lot of detail. But um, the DBMS needs to guarantee correctness by enforcing how the different concurrent threads are going to access it. So it needs to make choices uh, in the data structure and algorithm design in order to make sure that we don't introduce any of these concurrency errors um, by you know, having, having threads operate concurrently on, on some sort of shared object. So uh, when we're talking about correctness, we, we um, can be referring to kind of two different levels, and it, it depends on the context. So um, ha having a, a, a protocol with some correctness criteria, we could be talking about logical correctness, so this is the first type. It means basically uh, imagine I have um, a, a data structure like an index or something and I want to insert a key like key five. Uh, so I, I perform the write. And then if, if I go back uh, to read key five from the index, I should see it. So I should be able to read my own writes. So this is kind of like at, at a um, logical level what uh, we expect the, the requirements of the uh, uh, correctness protocol to be. At the physical level, um, we're actually talking at, at a little bit lower level, uh, and we really mean to protect the internal representation of the object. So 
uh, things like the pointers in the DBMS or uh, the, the you know, layout of a tuple and in a, in a, uh, the keys and the values in a tuple, that kind of stuff. We want to make sure all of that um, is protected and doesn't get corrupted uh, by, by concurrent um, modifications. Things like, you know, if you wind up with a pointer to an empty or an invalid page or something, that's you know, bad because you're going to wind up with a seg fault or reading wrong data or something like that. So kind of what we're going to be talking about today um, is, is physical correctness and how we can ensure that in the index data structures that we've talked about in the previous lectures. And we'll cover this, this logical correctness idea um, later in the semester, I think after the midterm. So at a high level, uh, today's agenda is we're going to start with kind of a review of latches and, and an overview of what mean, we mean by that, how, how to implement them basically um, at a low level. Uh, then we're going to talk about how to use latches in, in a hash table to make that a concurrent hash table. And then um, some more advanced usages in a B plus tree. So a hash table is kind of uh, a little easier to make concurrent uh, to turn into a concurrent data structure, B plus trees are a little more difficult. And then finally, we'll just end with a, um, an example of some of the problems uh, you can run into in uh, B plus trees with, or with, with concurrent access. So I think uh, I had this slide in an earlier lecture. Um, I just kind of wanted to go over again the, the difference here. So uh, again, I, I um, mentioned in, in the, the previous lecture that there's this difference between locks versus latches. So if you are from an OS or systems background, um, what we in the, the database world refer to as a latch, they call a lock. So you may uh, run into some confusion there, but there's a reason that kind of the, the database world has come up with this um, naming convention. So the, 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 what we in databases call a lock is actually a, a higher level construct that's protecting the database's logical contents from concurrent transactions. So what does that mean? Well, it's protecting things like tuples or pages or tables or uh, those sorts of abstract uh, or abstractions that we you know, have in our system, but they're not um, you know, low-level physical uh, uh, details. So the, the locks are held for a longer duration, typically the, the full duration of a transaction. So again, we haven't really talked about what a, what a transaction is yet, but uh, basically we want um, our transactions to perform some kind of consistent and atomic update of, of the uh, database. So in order to ensure that, one way to, one way to uh, perform it is through locking. So we can hold locks for the duration of all of the, the changes that we're making to the database. And finally, as I said, since we want these uh, changes to, to occur um, atomically, we need to be able to roll back changes if you know, we get partway through and we need to abort or we crash for some reason. So we need to be able to roll back the changes that we made. So that's, that's kind of uh, um, locks operating at the logical level. At a, at a lower, like physical level, is, is what we call latches. So these protect like the critical sections of uh, DBMS internal you know, data structures or algorithms or uh, whatever it is you're executing, the critical sections of that code from um, concurrent modification by other threads. And they're held usually for the, the duration of the operation, so for as short as possible, we just want to acquire the latch, do whatever our critical execute, whatever our critical section is, and then release the latch so that uh, we don't you know, block other threads from making progress. And uh, uh, we don't need to have any notion of rollback um, in this case. So if we make a change, then the, the change, the scope of the change, is only valid for the uh, critical section. Right? We're not going to go back and undo. Um, changes or modifications that we made in, in other times when the, the latches were acquired. So um, they're, they're held for a much shorter duration. And this is to allow uh, uh, concurrent threads to make progress without uh, blocking them. So um, from, from this, this uh, book that I mentioned last time, um, Modern B 
tree techniques. Um, there's this nice table in it that kind of breaks down the, the high level differences between locks and latches. Um, the, the way to read this is you can look at you know, the, the um, action in the, the left column there and then see what, what applies to locks versus what applies to latches. So as I said, we're gonna be focusing on latches. So um, you know, latches separate uh, concurrent threads. They are protecting our in-memory data structures, so we're only acquiring latches on, on uh, data structures that exist in memory, things like um, indexes. Uh, they are only valid during the, the critical section, so we only want to acquire it for the critical section and release it as soon as possible. Uh, we only have two modes, and this is going to be important for what uh, some of the algorithms we're going to talk about. So there's, there's a read mode, um, and a write mode. Uh, there's, there's no notion of uh, deadlock detection or um, kind of resolving deadlocks in latches. So the way that we avoid um, deadlock is, is strictly through coding discipline. So we need to very carefully write the, the code, whether it's the index traversal code or whatever, whatever it is inside our DBMS that we're writing, it needs to use latching, uh, we need to be very careful writing that code in order to avoid deadlocks because the, that's, that's the only thing preventing them from showing up. Um, and then the, the, the final piece is where uh, locks versus latches are stored. So latches are, are usually embedded somehow directly in the data structure that uh, you're, you're doing the latching on. So like I said, uh, we're gonna cover this, this idea of locks uh, in, a, in a later lecture. Uh, after the midterm. So are there any questions kind of about the, the differences here before we move on? Okay, so uh, I mentioned there are these two different latch modes. So in read mode, um, basically multiple threads can read the same object at the same time. If we're both just reading, there's no concurrency problem that can come up because uh, the values aren't going to change. Um, and a, a thread is therefore free to acquire the read latch if another thread, uh, another concurrent thread already has it in, in read mode. On the other hand, in write mode, um, only one thread can have uh, the write latch at a time. So only one thread can be uh, accessing the object in write mode. And other threads uh, who, who want to acquire a write, rat, write latch or a read latch um, have to block. So they can't acquire a latch if another thread has it in uh, write mode. It's, it's uh, like an exclusive latch. So you can think about it in terms of this uh, compatibility matrix here that shows when uh, you can have concurrent, um, you, uh, two threads can concurrently hold locks. So the only case where it's safe to do so, or sorry, concurrently hold latches. I'll, I'll probably uh, mix that up a few more times in the, the lecture, but um, the only case where two threads can concurrently hold um, a latch is when they're both read latches. Otherwise, it, it's not valid. So as I said, we're gonna start with just kind of looking at uh, a, a very um, high level overview of the like basic concepts um, behind how you implement latches. Uh, you can go much deeper and there's much more than what we're going to talk about here, but this is just kind of the, the uh, quick uh, summary of the, the key concepts that you need to understand. Uh, and we're going to look at these three basic implementations. So the blocking OS mutex, uh, test and set spin latch, and a reader writer latches. So the first one, as I said, is the blocking OS mutex. Uh, this is the most common, this is what you get uh, if you declare like a STD mutex in C++. Uh, they're really simple to use. Uh, the, the overhead, um, I, maybe 25 nanoseconds doesn't sound that bad, but uh, if you're you know, doing a, a ton of latching operations on a, a really large data structure to scale up, uh, these, this overhead can add up. So it's, it's certainly something that you, you don't wanna be making frivolous um, latching calls here. So uh, just imagine we have this program here, you know, where we're uh, defining a, a mutex um, and we want to have our critical section protected by the mutex. Uh, it does, 
Anyone know how this uh, mutex is implemented in Linux? You can shout it out if you know. So it's a, it's a type def for this pthread mutex, which uh, is, is actually uh, something called a futex, which is a fast user space mutex. Um, basically, what, what a futex is, is that it, it has these kind of two uh, latches inside. So there's this fast uh, user space spin latch, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but just uh, it's something that you can can access uh, very efficiently in user space. And then there's also this more heavyweight blocking OS latch uh, sort of as a fallback. So I'll explain kind of the, how, how this looks and, and why it's set up this way. So imagine we have these two concurrent um, threads that are running and they both want to acquire uh, this, this um, they want to call lock on the, the mutex here. So they're first both going to go to the user space latch uh, and as I said, it's, it's a lot lower overhead to, to access than uh, this OS latch. So they're both going to go there, and let's say this, you know, this uh, one on the left here wins. So uh, that, that thread is going to get uh, the latch, and the other thread is going to have to block. And what it's going to do is going to go uh, drop down into the heavyweight OS latch. So uh, kind of what, what has happened now is when this uh, first thread is done, it'll call unlock, and then the, the other thread will get um, woken up when it, it uh, is able to use the latch. So I mentioned that uh, there's this uh, uh, user space latch, and that's the, the second one we're gonna talk about. Um, basically, this is implemented as what's called a test and set spin latch. Uh, so uh, it, it's, again, as I said, very efficient. It's just a single uh, instruction. The, you can use atomic instructions um, to, to do this, and we'll talk about uh, atomic instructions in one second. But basically, it, it makes sure that the, the uh, test and set, so that's you know, technically two things. First, you have to test, then you have to set the value. Um, it makes sure that that happens atomically in, in hardware. So. Um, this, this is going to exist entirely in user space code, so we're not going to have to go to the OS at all. Uh, that's why it's more efficient. Um, but there are a lot of problems that come up when you're, when you're using this approach. So uh, it's not for free. You have kind of cache coherence problems that can come up because you have uh, kind of these, these uh, uh, multiple threads that need to cross kind of these uh, um, memory boundaries in order to acquire the same latch. Um, and you can also run into this contention problem. So if you have a lot of threads that are all trying to acquire the same latch, then what they're going to end up doing is kind of uh, just looping um, forever in this loop, kind of burning cycles. So uh, basically, you know, every time we call latch test and set, if I, don't get, if I don't get the latch, then I drop into this loop and I kind of just keep going and going and going. And since there's no visibility into what instructions I'm actu actually executing, I mean, in this case, it's, it's just me uh, looping, waiting for something. Since there's no visibility into, the, into that, the OS uh, doesn't know, you know what, what, my, what my code is doing. So there's no way for the OS uh, to, to put put my thread um, to sleep like if I were using a, a, an OS level latch uh, in the, the previous approach number one. So uh, that's kind of the, the uh, danger here is if there's a lot of contention, you just have a bunch of uh, threads you know, running, spinning, 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 uh, trying to acquire the latch and they're kind of just you know, running fruitlessly, um, wasting cycles when you could you know, have put them to sleep and, and be doing something else. So uh, that's why uh, this is a, a favorite thing of uh, Linus Torvalds, who is the um, creator of, of Linux. Uh, and you may also know he has some um, uh, particularly uh, uh, creative uh, ways of voicing his, his opinions. Uh, so. Basically, uh, he is, is uh, very against the use of, of spin locks in user space. Um, 
unless you actually know what you're doing. Uh, I don't know who's the judge of whether you actually know what you're doing. Um, I, I like to think that in, in uh, the database world, we know what we're doing when, when building a DBMS, but um, kind of, he, he, I think the, the concern here is about the dangers I mentioned in terms of uh, the, the scalability and, and the uh, contention problems. So uh, the, the third latch implementation we're going to talk about um, is what's called a reader-writer latch. So basically you can think about the, the first two um, approaches that we had as kind of primitives. So those give us you know, uh, individual latching primitives. And a reader-writer latch is kind of like a, a, a higher level um, uh, construct that we've built from, or we can build from these lower level uh, latch primitives. So what this is going to do is, again, remember we said that you could have uh, concurrent readers with no um, uh, uh, concurrency, without introducing concurrency errors in your code. So uh, if we have reader-writer reader latches, it's going to allow us to have uh, concurrent readers. And um, kind of the, the, the thing that we need to do in order to enable this is that we need to, to manage uh, read and write queues um, ourselves. We need to keep track of kind of uh, um, which, uh, we need to keep track of whether threads are requesting latches for reads versus writes and um, that can lead to, to some problems which, which uh, we'll see here in a second. So uh, basically imagine, you can imagine it like at a high level like this where we have a, a separate read and write latch inside our um, big reader writer latch uh, and we have Basically, these, these uh, two counts for each, which is the number of threads that have successfully acquired either a read or write latch, and the number of threads waiting on either a read or write latch. So, uh, you know, imagine we have this first thread show up and it, it wants to acquire a, um, a read latch. So, what we're going to do is, you know, give it out. There's no reason not to. No one has any uh, existing write latch, so there's no problem there. So we're going to give out uh, to that thread the latch, and then we're going to um, increment our count of threads uh, that, that have uh, read latches active by one. So again, imagine another um, uh, thread shows up here. It also wants to request a read latch. Well, there's not going to be a problem here because um, we can have multiple uh, threads with, with read latches out at the same time, so we can give that out. And again, increment the count by one. And now let's say we have a, uh, another thread show up um, and request a write latch. Well, we have these two read, read latches outstanding. Um, you know, we know we can't have a, a concurrent writer, uh, so we need to, to uh, block that thread and we're going to uh, uh, put it in the, the waiting queue. So what's, what's kind of the problem with, with this approach that I uh, show here? Starvation? Yes, so the answer is starvation, uh, which I guess I also mentioned in the slide there. Um, but the idea is imagine this uh, uh, other uh, reader shows up and um, the, the reader thread wants to acquire a read latch now. So we could have a situation where kind of just these reads keep building up and uh, we're, we're never getting the read latch count down to zero so that way one of the, the writers can uh, uh, take over. So what we could end up with is the writers being starved while these readers just keep going forever. Yes? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, could you repeat? So the the let me try and rephrase it. The the question is about um, why does this why does this make the the state inconsistent, right? Uh, if you have these these reads and writers coming in at the same time, so 
it's not uh, about the state of the latch that we're worried about becoming inconsistent. It's, it's whatever the latch is protecting. So the latch is just a, a, an object to prevent concurrent accesses to some other thing. So it could be like, for example, a, a, an index page or a, a, a leaf node in an index. And if we have you know, readers that are uh, uh, running around in the index reading stuff, at the same time as we're making changes to the index, we could uh, end up with some, some concurrency errors. And we'll kind of go through cases when you can run into those. So it's, it's not about the state of this latch here. It's, it's about whatever the latch is protecting. So uh, the, the question is, if, if the, the two reads arrive and then um, the, the writer arrives after them and then this other reader arrives, uh, the, the latest reader on, on the end here should be reading uh, the whatever modifications the writer makes. Uh, is that OK? So uh, this, this is an entire other class. I think it's uh, maybe, I, I don't know how many lectures it is, but it's a, it's a whole other class about concurrency control theory and what the guarantees are provided by the DBMS. So the short answer is that uh, we don't actually care about the, um, the real-time order in which transactions arrive. We don't care about if, if uh, you know, Imagine a time step, and we have the first reader show up at time step zero, the second one show up at time step one, the writer shows up at time step two, and then another reader shows up at time step three. Uh, as long as we can guarantee that each of the readers sees a consistent uh, snapshot or a consistent view of the data stored in the database, we don't actually care if they execute in the exact serial timestamp order in which they showed up. So we can execute them out of order um, for lots of reasons, but mostly to increase throughput, to in increase performance, uh, as long as they see a consistent view of the data stored in the database. So we're, we're not trying to ensure that um, everything uh, uh, executes in exact chronological order that, that it showed up in. Does that make sense? Are there any other questions? OK. So uh, like I said, to, to prevent starvation here, um, basically, we, we would want to build in some logic that's going to put this, this reader uh, that, that arrived to sleep. I, I mean, maybe you could look at, uh, there, there are all sorts of different ways to do it. Maybe you could look at the number of uh, currently outstanding readers versus writers, and you want to let some writers through. So. Um, you, you're going to put the reader to sleep and, and uh, let, let some of your writers execute now. So that, that's kind of uh, how to prevent starvation. We'll, we're not going to go too much into it here. So uh, as I said, um, we want to take our uh, data structures that, that we talked about in the previous uh, lectures and figure out how to uh, use the latches that we've been discussing in order to um, protect our data structures and make them concurrent. So we're just going to start with a, a really simple uh, linear probing hash table. And it's easy uh, to, to do it in this case uh, because we're restricting the direction that the threads kind of access or move through the uh, data structure. So recall that when you know, you're doing the, the linear probing, you're always scanning forward until you wrap around, but you're always scanning forward um, from the, the place where you hash into the table. So we all of, all of the threads that are accessing the hash table are scanning forward in this uh, same way. So it, the, the important thing here is that deadlocks aren't going to be possible. And as I said, there's kind of no mechanism to detect or, or um, resolve deadlocks. So we're going to have to be really careful about how we implement the, the algorithms and data structures in order to prevent them ourselves. So the way that we're going to do it in this case uh, is by enforcing this, this ordering 
where all of the threads are going to scan uh, forward through the hash table. And then, you know, I, if you want to resize the hash table, then you just will do something really simple. Um, you'll take a global, like, right latch on the entire table, and that, that will prevent um, uh, concurrent problems there. So uh, we're not, we're not going to talk about resizing, but, you know, if you have the different, the different uh, hash table implementations that we talked about, extendable hashing, that kind of stuff, um, there are different ways that you can do it uh, more incrementally. So uh, basically the, the two different ways that you can implement latching on the hash table are either to uh, latch pages or to latch individual slots. So this is a good example of a trade-off uh, basically between more compute versus more storage. So uh, on the one hand, you know, if, if I have um, more, uh, uh, if I have more uh, latches that I need to store, for example, in the slot latches, because they're finer grained than the page level, um, I'm, I'm trading off storage for more fine grained access. On the other end, if I'm at the uh, uh, page latching level, I might be latching whole pages that are um, blocking out concurrent threads from accessing them. So kind of there's this, this trade-off we need to consider in, in kind of how we uh, design our latching algorithms to balance uh, these competing interests. So, uh, I mean, just as an example, in the, the page setting, you know, two, th two threads might need to access different slots, but um, only one can proceed or only one would be able to proceed at a time if, if there's a, a right lock on the page. So, uh, just to, to illustrate these, these uh, two approaches, uh, we have the first um, page latch uh, for the, the, the uh, linear probing hash table. Um, imagine we have some transaction one that wants to find the key D, so we're going to hash D, and let's say D hashes to there. So uh, now we have to scan forward, but before we do that, we need to be able to um, acquire a latch on that page, saying that we're reading it to prevent another uh, thread from coming in and concurrently modifying it. So uh, we've acquired the, or we're, we're requesting the read latch, let's say we're granted it, then we're going to be able to start our scan of the page. So uh, now imagine that while we're uh, in here looking at this page uh, in, in transaction one, some other transaction, transaction two, comes along and wants to insert the key E. So again, we're going to hash E, and let's say E hashes to this uh, uh, slot here. But of course, um, the uh, uh, T1 already has a, has a latch on the page, so uh, we're going to need to block T2 while uh, T1 is doing whatever it needs to do. So T1 is going to read along, and it's going to, you know, doesn't find uh, D in that page, so now it, it wants to come down to the next page. Well, we uh, are down here at this next page. We've already checked it. We know D is not in there. It's not going to be in there. So uh, it's safe for us to release the latch on page 1, so that way uh, T2 can make progress, uh, T2 can, can become unblocked and start uh, executing its, its insert operation. So we're going to release our latch, now we're going to request uh, for T1 a new read latch on page 2. So kind of now we're, we, we can uh, go through this scanning process and uh, T1 finds what it was looking for, so we're done there. Now, since the, the latch on the previous page one is released, uh, T2 can acquire the right latch, gets the right latch, and then it can start doing its insert operation. So, tries to insert at C. We see that, you know, there's nothing, uh, uh, there's, no, there's no room for me to insert there. So, we have to scan forward, and we come down here. Since T1 is finished, uh, we're, not, we're not blocked. T2 can acquire the, the right latch on page 2 and uh, now do what it needs to do to insert E. So do, are, there, are there any questions about this um, page-based page latching? Yes? Uh, so the, the question is when, if you're performing a deletion and your algorithm involves shifting, uh, do you need to acquire latches on multiple pages? 
Uh, yes, um, you, you may even need to acquire latches on the whole table because uh, depending on the order, um, you, you might wrap around, right? Or, so I, guess, I guess you could, yeah, so if, if you're doing shifting, you're going to need to acquire latches in, in order uh, when you're doing the shifting. If you're just installing a tombstone, then you don't need to acquire latches on pages because you're not moving anything between the pages. You're just, uh, but it, it, anytime, anytime you're doing any kind of compaction or reorganizing across multiple pages, you need latches on all of them. But again, um, as I said, and this is, this is important, so if you, uh, I guess if you're, if you're doing a deletion, you always need to make sure uh, that your latches, if you're doing a deletion in a shift, so a compaction, then your latches always have to be acquired in you know, the scan forward order. You can't acquire them out of order because then you can wind up with deadlocks. Are there any other questions? Okay, so um, the, the slot-based alternative uh, is pretty straightforward. Again, um, let's say T1 wants to, to find D, so we're gonna hash D to this uh, slot here. Um, acquire the read lock this time instead of on the whole page on the individual slot. So this is much finer grained, and then we can do our read. Now, what this allows is uh, transaction two where we want to insert E, E hashes to um, a, a slot also in page one, but because we're doing the latching at the uh, slot level, there's not gonna be a problem here. So transaction two can acquire a right latch on this slot in order to try to perform its insert. So now when uh, transaction one reads, uh, or wants to go and read the next slot, uh, it's gonna block waiting for um, transaction two to, to release its latch. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, we've already checked um, the, the value in the, the first slot for transaction one. So it's safe for us to release this latch since there's no, uh, we don't need to go back to it. We looked at it, it's not what we were looking for, it's not key D, so we wanna move on. But we don't, while we're blocked waiting for transaction two, we don't wanna prevent other uh, concurrent transactions. So imagine there's some transaction three, that wants to come read A, we don't want to prevent that from making progress. Um, so we, we want to give up that latch uh, as soon as we can. So again, uh, as transaction two proceeds, it's going to give up its uh, latch on the, the previous slot and get a, a latch on the next slot. So now uh, T1 can become unblocked and, and start its, its scan forward. So again, T1 has to wait for uh, T2 to finish whatever it's doing. T2 gives up. Uh, the latch moves on to the next slot, which is empty, so it acquires the right latch, uh, and it can write the value or key E to that slot now. Um, and of course, uh, transaction one can proceed and, and scan down to uh, find D. So, uh, does this make sense? Do you have any questions? Okay, so in the uh, hash table lecture, which is lecture six, um, I'm sure all of you remember at exactly 22 minutes and 48 seconds, I said that uh, you could implement this linear probing hash table using no latches. So uh, we just saw two examples of how to do it with latches. Um, I mentioned that you could do it without latches. I think my exact quote was, you don't need latching for this, you can just use atomic compare and swap operations. So what is a compare and swap operation? Well, a, a compare and swap operation is a hardware instruction, so it's an atomic instruction that is going to compare the contents of some memory location M to a given value V. So there's gonna be two possible things that can happen. If the values are equal, so if they match, then we're going to install the new given value V prime into M. Otherwise, the operation is gonna fail. And this is going to be the basis of, of our um, uh, test and set latch, which is going to spin in this loop, trying to uh, uh, test a value and then set the value at the memory location atomically um, until it succeeds. So if it keeps failing, it's just gonna keep uh, spinning. You can do the same thing to update the uh, slots in the hash table. So 
just as an example, let's say we have you know, the, the, the memory address, we want to update there, we want to compare it to value 20, so if it exists as value 20, we want to set the new value to 30. So uh, in this case, if that's true, we have uh, 20 stored in the memory location, so we're going to succeed, and we're going to update uh, the value to 30. So the way that this would work for like um, this, this insert example here is that we could perform a, uh, a test and swap in, uh, atomic instruction that says, is this slot uh, equal to some empty value? So let's uh, assign a special empty value, maybe the max possible uh, integer key that we're, we're um, going to assign here, and we say, is this slot empty? Uh, if that succeeds, then we'll atomically replace it with our uh, new value. If it fails, then you know we just uh, continue scanning on to the next slot. Okay, so that's compare and swap. Uh, that's the end of hash tables. Uh, so are there any questions about that before we move on to the B plus tree? We might run a little over time here, so if we don't get through everything, uh, we can just push it, uh, whatever we don't get to, to the beginning of the next lecture. So uh, B plus tree concurrency control. I said that we we're starting with hash tables because they were pretty uh, straightforward to do relative to, to B plus trees. Um, so uh, now let's see why these are trickier. So the, the key idea, again, just like the hash table, we want to be able to allow uh, multiple threads to access the hash table. We want, to, we want to allow multiple threads to be able to read and update the B plus tree at the same time. So again, updating here be, becomes a little bit uh, trickier than just with the, the, how we're doing the updates in the hash table, because we need to worry about kind of the different types of reorganization that can occur in the B plus tree. So specifically, we have to protect against these two types of problems that can come up. So one is that threads are trying to modify uh, the contents of a node at the same time. So imagine, you know, we want to insert into a particular node, and we have two threads that are, have uh, conflicting rights in that node. Uh, that's one, one issue that can come up. Another problem, um, and this is, is trickier to deal with, is that one thread can be traversing the tree while some other thread is doing some type of reorganization, so like splitting or merging uh, nodes in the tree. And you know, during during your traversal, um, if if you're not careful, you can wind up with uh, uh, going to, to wrong or incorrect locations. So, kind of, we'll see an example of of uh, uh, what this might look like. So, imagine we have a transaction T1 that wants to delete key 44. So, key 44 is is down in the the corner there. So, basically, we just go through the the usual B plus tree search algorithm. That's fine. We're going to search down. Um, looking at each of the uh, 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 division keys to see, you know, whether we, which which uh, slot we go into, and we're going to get down to this node uh, in the bottom or this leaf in the, the bottom I, um, and we're going to delete uh, the value 44 from that node. So so far um, we we don't have any problems, except we notice that. Um, transaction one has deleted something from this leaf node and now the node is empty. So what do we have to do? Rebalance the tree, right? So this is going to trigger a rebalance where uh, just a, a, as a simple example here, let's say we're going to, to uh, borrow a key from our sibling H and move it over so that we're not, um, uh, we're not empty. So we want to take this value 41 from H and move it over to our uh, a leaf node there, and then we're going to have to update the the um, uh, key in D so that we know which which node to go to to find 41. So this is the operation we need to do. We've done the deletion. We now need to do this this uh, rebalancing. But let's say that right before we we do the rebalance, we uh, get put to sleep. So we're thread one is sleeping, and now this other thread T2 comes in and it wants to find the key 41. So that's the key that you know, th thread one was gonna move over, thread two wants to find key 41. So this is fine, we'll start doing our traversal, uh, no problem, gets down the tree, gets here, it says, okay, great, uh, 41 is, is greater than or equal to 38, and it's less than 44, so I know I need to go 
to uh, leaf node H. So now let's say that thread two is going to get put to sleep. So thread two, the, the thread two goes to sleep while it's at uh, uh, node D. It already knows it needs to go to um, leaf node H. It has the, the, the pointer right there for where to go. Um, but now it, it's, it's asleep. So this, this thread one wakes back up and it continues what it was working on, which was uh, moving key 41 from the sibling node and updating the, uh, the key in, in D. And now when uh, uh, thread two wakes up again, it's gonna come down here and it's gonna say, hey, uh, I, I thought key 41 should have been in here, it's not here, so it must not be in the index. But you know, thread two doesn't realize that in, in the meantime, thread one has moved it over. So this is one example of a, a concurrency problem that can come up if, there, if you don't have any, any latches or protections around um, these nodes in your tree. You're allowing concurrent reads and writes to go on uh, without any kind of uh, um, protection mechanism. So this is kind of the, the, the one case is T2 gets a, a, you know, a false negative. It, it thinks, okay, T, you know, um, uh, 41, the key 41 is in the tree. Um, so it's gonna give back a wrong answer. Uh, another thing that could happen is, you know, uh, we, we could have somehow moved uh, node H. It could have gotten moved or rebalanced around by concurrent concurrent writers, and then we end up with you know a seg fault because now we have a, a pointer to a bad location. Uh, you know, node H doesn't doesn't uh, exist anymore. Maybe so. Kind of the the way that we're going to get around this in the B plus tree is through um, a technique called latch coupling or latch crabbing. Um, I, I think latch crabbing is the uh, the old old. Uh, old timer term for it. Um, I think on, on Wikipedia you'll find latch coupling. I think it's called latch crabbing because of the way kind of a, a like a crab walks on the beach, um, moving forward in this this uh, kind of fashion. But um, basically, the the high level idea is it's a, a protocol or an algorithm um, that that is going to allow us uh, to have multiple threads access and modify the B plus tree at the same time. So the basic idea of the algorithm is that for each node in our traversal, we're going to get a latch for its parent, we're going to get a latch for the child, um, and we're going to release the latch only if the parent is safe. So what does safe mean? Uh, specifically, a safe node is one that we know uh, is guaranteed not to split or merge based on the update that we're going to make. So if, if we're going to do an insertion or a deletion of a, of a particular key in a node, we can call that um, key. We can call that node safe if we know that our insertion or deletion can't possibly trigger some kind of rebalancing or reorganization. So on insertion, if the node isn't full, then we know that there's going to guaranteed to be room. If we get the latch, there's going to be guaranteed to be room um, to to do the insert we need to do. If it's if it's we're going to do a deletion. We need to make sure that we don't need to uh, merge the node um, if, it, if it gets too empty. So we, we, the, the high level idea is that um, we only want to release the latch as soon as we know it's safe. And we can, as soon as the thread that's performing whatever operation it's performing knows it's safe to release the latch. So this sounds really complicated. Why are we doing it? Uh, the answer is that it, it improves concurrency um, substantially for B plus trees. So, uh, imagine, you know, we, we um, only allowed one thread ever to read, to read from or write to the B plus tree that would, you know, uh, really bottleneck our system. So we want to be able to allow um, these, these concurrent reads and writes to, to happen, but we still need to make sure they happen in a, in a, a safe way, error-free way. So uh, kind of the, the uh, more concrete algorithm with the specific latches that we need. Um, uh, we're going we're gonna to always start at the root node and go down repeatedly, so this is going to be important because, uh, as I said in the um, uh, hash table case, where we're always always scanning forward in the hash table, we're always accessing the data structure uh, in the same way. In this case, we're always descending the tree from the root node, so we can ensure that all the threads are accessing the data structure in the same way. So. Um, Basically, we're going to start at the root node and we're going to acquire a, a, a read latch on the child. 
And then um, as soon as we have the read latch on the child, we know it's safe to uh, uh, unlatch the parent because we, we don't need that anymore. For inserts and deletes, um, we're going to st still start at the root node and, and descend the tree. And we're going to be uh, obtaining uh, right latches, W latches as needed. Um, but as soon as we latch the child, we want to check to see if it's safe. So if, if we check the, the child that we just latched, and as I said uh, in, in the previous slide, we can determine um, whether it's an insert or a delete, whether the child is safe, then as soon as we do that, we want to uh, release the latch on, on all the ancestors that we, uh, the, the right latch on all the ancestors that we had, uh, as soon as it's safely possible, so that we can let other threads make progress in the system. So just as, as an example, if we have this tree here, and you know, we have right latches all the way down the tree, starting at the root node, um, we want to we want to kind of get rid of our latches as soon as possible, so we can let other um, uh, we can let other threads access the the data structure because otherwise we're we're kind of holding all the latches for ourselves. So uh, just uh, we'll go through a, a, a few examples quickly, and if uh, if you have any questions during them, just just stop me, and we can we can uh, talk through them. So um, the the first one is just really simple. We want to find the key thirty eight in the tree. So we're going to start, as I said, at the root node. We're going to acquire a read latch on the root node, figure out, OK, which, which direction I need to go. We know that 38 is, is uh, greater than 20, so we have to go right. So we're going to acquire a read latch now here on the B node. And um, because we know uh, that, that we're here at the B node, we're, we're uh, safe, we have the, the latch that we need, we can uh, release the latch that we're holding on A. Because no one is going to come in and, and, and mess up the B node. We have the B node already. We have the latch on it. So we can safely release our latch, our read latch on A. And other threads can come in now and, and do the same um, latching on A that, that we just did. So again, you know, 38 is greater than 35. So we're going to come down here. And it, again, we have, we have the latch on node D. So we can release our read latch on node B. And now we get down to this leaf node, and again, we can release our, our um, latches kind of in this, this coupling fashion. And we're down here, we can read the value uh, 38 that we were looking for. So we're done. Are there any questions about this? OK, let's do something a little more exciting. Uh, let's do a delete. So we're going to delete key 38. So again, we're going to start at the, the root node, take the right latch, um, move down, figure out, OK, 38 is to the right. So we have to go down the tree on that side. We're going to get the right latch on B. So uh, the, the, the question here is whether or not uh, we need to coalesce B or we need to um, uh, change the structure in the subtree. Since we're deleting 38, we don't know what's going to happen below it. We may need to, to reorganize. So since uh, we, we may need to do this reorganization at this level, we can't release the latch on A yet. We need to hold on to that for now. So again, we're going to move down here. And now that we're at this node D, we can see, OK, even if we delete 38, you know, D is plenty full. We're not going to need to do a rebalance. So we know that D won't have to merge at all. We, we don't have to change any of the structure. We can just remove the key 38 from the, the D node. Uh, so it's safe for us to uh, release the latches on A and B. So now the question is, uh, how should we release the latches? Um, what, what order do we want to release them in? So by a show of hands, uh, how many people think it should be um, in, in reverse order, so popping back up our uh, tree in the, the reverse order, the rear, like um, a stack. A few, okay. How many people think it should be in the other order? First in for like a queue. Okay, how many people think it doesn't matter? Just one. Um, Okay, the answer, the answer is uh, actually the, the, well, there's two answers. So one answer, <laughs> sorry, one, one answer is it doesn't matter. We can release them in what, whatever order we want and it'll be logically correct. 
The, the other answer, which is for performance reasons, we want to release them in the order in which we acquired them. So you want to start at the top of the tree and release them in that order. And the reason is because, the, the, as I sort of alluded to earlier, the latches at the higher level of the tree um, kind of prevent uh, uh, concurrent access to, to uh, those larger sub-trees sub uh, or sub-ranges of the tree. So um, you want to, as much as possible, release the, the uh, earlier acquired locks as soon as possible, so the, the ones that are towards the top of the tree. So again, kind of just finishing out the example, move down here, uh, perform the delete, and we can just remove it, and we're done. Release our latch, and now we're, we're fully done. Um, okay. So that was a delete. Now let's uh, do an insert. So let's say we want to insert key 45. Again, it's the, the usual uh, procedure here. We start at the top. Um, we start acquiring these, these right latches. Um, in this case, we know that if D needs to split, that B has enough room uh, to accommodate it, so it's safe for us to release the latch on A in this case. So again, we can kind of keep moving down the tree, uh, acquiring our latches, and we see here, uh, you know, the node's not going to, to uh, split, so we can release those, those uh, latches on B and D that we had, and then finish our operation. So again, kind of even before you perform the insert, as soon as you get the latch, you want to check to see if it's safe for you to release any of your uh, previously acquired latches. Because again, as much as possible, um, we want to, to maximize the amount of concurrent threads that are able to access the, the data structure. Okay, so uh, I think probably we'll do Maybe one more, and then we'll roll over the, the rest of the, the lecture in the next class. But uh, so in this example is another insert. We're going to insert key 25. Um, and again, it's, it's the same procedure. Uh, we work down the tree here until we get to, to the slot that we need to go in. Uh, but now we have a problem uh, because we're, we're uh, going to need to split F so we need to hold the latch on the parent node uh, in order to, to prevent someone else from coming in and accessing the parent node until we're done doing our reorganization. So um, we're keeping that, that latch around. We get the latch on the parent, we get the latch on the leaf, and now we're going to, to, to do the split here to, to put in um, the key. So kind of ignore the, the sibling pointers um, for now, but kind of this is the the, the way that we do it. Now that we've, we've done the reorganization, uh, we can release our latches. So uh, are there any questions about this? Okay, so uh, kind of, I, I think we'll leave off with this observation. So the observation is that the first, what, what is the, the first step for all of the updates that we did in the tree? How does our algorithm work? What's the, what's the first thing we need to do? Yes? So the, the answer is take the latch on the root node. That's exactly correct. So in all of these cases, we're always taking a write latch, which again is more uh, exclusionary than a read latch. We're always taking a write latch um, on the root node. So. Every single time we're taking this, this uh, right latch on the root node and preventing other concurrent threads from coming in and accessing it. So uh, this be, can, can become a bottleneck if you have a lot of concurrent threads that are trying to access um, the, the tree. And it's going to, to this, this, this algorithm here, while it, it keeps uh, uh, the tree safe and it prevents concurrency errors from coming up, um, it, it, it uh, prevents us from getting really high concurrency. So, um, at the beginning of next class, we will uh, talk about a better latching algorithm um, that can help you get around these problems. So I will see you next time. Yeah.
St. Ives Brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Bust is mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. For a mic check, bust it. The bees are set to grab a 40. To put him the yoga, snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip and wipe your lips. You, my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives Brew on the double. 